Welcome to Ask the Experts. I'm Jill Schlesinger, editor-at-large of CBSMoneyWatch.com. I am joined by our editor-in-chief, Eric Schoenberg. And Eric, this is like, I think, a first for Ask the Experts. It's two Money Watch staffers with two guests. That's right. Uh, it's a wealth and embarrassment of experts here exactly. today. Exactly. And this is going to be such a good one because I think there may finally be some good news on the jobs front and people are starting to feel like things are loosening That's up. Right. So we thought we'd bring Dreamly two timely. two fantastic experts, especially in advance of uh, the big employment report on Friday. So first up, we have a returning guest, Ellen Gordon-Reeves. She is the author of the best-selling, and Eric, I think maybe the best-titled book for employment called Can I Wear My Nose Ring to the Interview? A Crash Course in Finding, Landing, and Keeping Your First Real Job. Career expert Ellen Gordon-Reeves offers advice on how to keep and get the job you want. She's a frequent guest on national television and radio shows, including CBS's The Early Show, CBS with... uh, Katie Couric, The Evening News, at Katie Couric, and then a bunch of other things that are not CBS related, so we won't plug them. (laughs) That's right. You know, come on. CBS with Scott Pelley now. Exactly. Well, as of June, right? Um, And she's been featured in print media, U.S. News and World Report, The Boston Post, The Boston Globe, The Here's the real interesting thing. Check this out. The first um, woman, the first Jewish woman to head the Harvard Alumni Association is right here in our midst. Ellen wow. Gordon. So Ellen, for all of you Harvard you. graduates, July who, one. Uh, at your term will start. Yes. The first Jewish exactly. woman. So not the first exactly. woman and not the first not the Jew. First woman. Eighth woman, right. Other, you know, other men. Uh-huh. Who Jewish, but yes. Uh, first Jewish it. woman. All right. I uh, thought I would just plug no, it. Yeah. yeah well, my, I, my first act was to share with the staff my recipes for Passover lasagna. Oh, <laughs> very good. I said, see, these are the advantages of a, di- you know, a little different uh, culture in the you, office. Can now, you wear a nose ring when you're the... Head of the Harvard Association? Oh, that's a good question. I <laughs> yeah, I'll try have to that. think about try that. that. Uh, let me ask that to our next guest, Ron Brown, who joins us via Skype. And he is a leading expert in the fields of leadership development, organizational change. The most important thing you need to know about Ron is he's a Money Watch blogger and he does great work for us. But Ron also is the founder and president of Banks Brown, a management consulting firm that specializes in providing leading edge skills to optimize the performance of leaders and organizations. He's done a lot of consulting. You must be very wealthy with all this consulting you're doing with all these big companies. You didn't trade burgers for advice, did you, with McDonald's? Well, I, I ate a lot of burgers for sure. <laughs> And that's you, part of the that's part of the fair there. So that's a good thing. And so anyway, he's done consulting for all these massive companies, Fortune 100, uh, PhD in psychology from the University of California at Berkeley. And yet you're wearing a suit. Why are you not? Are do you are you wearing Birkenstocks underneath there? I'm I'm belying the whole image of California laid back. People. I mean, what the heck happened uh, to you? You know, I'm a corporate guy and. Uh, so this is you know, this is the basic uniform in many places. So. No, it's professional. That's I love that. Look, that it's an suit. interview. Uh, and so let me ask you. So let's just dive into some of this stuff because there has been some thawing in the uh, jobs market, and uh, we're going to have a big report. But we've had a couple hundred thousand jobs that were created in the last two months. Um, I also noted, uh, Ellen, that in the last in the first quarter. Uh, the younger graduates seem to be doing a little bit better. So they had an increase of about 2.4% for those folks. And so how do you see, number one, how do you see graduation season and, and new entrants to the workforce? How are things changed this year versus last? Well, because it's loosening up a little bit, it, you know, people can be a little bit less nervous. But I think the recent grads still have to realize competition is stiff. And even though they're cheaper hires and even though they – have the ability to be more flexible, to be you know, paid less, to to do more with less. I think they still have to retain the competitive edge and and be the right person for the job. And Ron, we we also found out that uh, the National Association of Colleges and Employers they said for the first time since 2007, employers are reporting a double digit increase in their spring hiring projections. Now, in all these companies where you're consulting, are you seeing or hearing about that there are new opportunities and that things are actually uh, kind of loosening up in the jobs market? Uh, I had a little transmission problem there. All right. we got, oh, There you are. You're back. I love yeah. this. It looks like you're tiled over so, as if you were actually um, 
doing something dirty? Is it you, you doing anything? Are you, is everything okay there? I mean, are we, did you tile for now. some reason? Is everything okay? Okay. So here's your question. I just made Victoria, our producer, lose it. She's the, like, stop talking. Okay. So, Ron, um, in all the consulting you're doing, are they talking about new positions? Is it is it getting better out there? It is getting better. Uh, and I agree with uh, our, our guests there that what we're really trying to do uh, for young graduates is is help them find ways to differentiate themselves. Uh, it, it's so competitive that they must have some particular feature that differentiates themselves, like overcoming adversity or something that uh, they've done in their lives that make them unique and different. I think that's going to be the first cutting edge of this this job market right now. And Eric, you see resumes all the time. I mean, you hire. And so how do how do you're in the other side you're the guy who's hiring mm, how are you mm. differentiating when you get a pile of resumes what stands out to you i think that uh, ron is on to something and i think it's what's really important is to have the story that uh that hiring managers can latch on to so they can say especially if you don't have a great uh, deal of experience but if you can weave a story around the experience how you overcame trouble and brought your division to profitability or if you're a new college graduate how you overcame you know, a disadvantaged background or or whatever, a lot of competition, something that someone can say, I like this person, I know they can handle pressure and they can handle this job and I'm going to like working with them. And, and you know, interesting, uh, Dan Cadlick had written a blog post and I'm going to put it up in a second. Sorry, Roland, don't yell at me because it's not ready yet. But one of the things he said was that uh, new entrants to the workforce are not very good at talking about themselves and that they should practice with maybe like a 15 second commercial about who they are. But Ellen, they also say you should have three to five stories like stu kind of tucked in your pocket to be able to talk about those things that Eric says, how you differentiate yourself. But what kind of story can you tell? You're 20 years old, you know nothing. You know nada. No, that's not true. You, you know things, you have to be able to talk about what you do know in terms of transferable <laughs> skills. So let's say you ran the box office for your college theater production. You, you can talk about that, about sales, about marketing, and maybe one night, one of the Leads got sick and you had to scramble to find someone and replace them, but the audience never knew. It's just all about how you tell these stories to show what you did, what you learned from the experience, and how it might be applicable to the, the next uh, job that you have. And, and when you do that, um, talk a little bit about how the, these young folks can, can get a little interview experience. What should they do? Should they practice with a friend? Oh, you have to practice. You really? cannot walk into an interview without having practiced. And so you have got to do it with friends. You can use your career offices at college. Difficult to do it with your parents or guardians, people who may be a little over-invested in what you have to say, and they'll, they may make you nervous. Try to find a friend. What the great, a great use of parents or older relatives or, 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 uh, or mentors is that you can say, could you introduce me to someone at another workplace or even at your workplace who could do a mock interview with me and assess me as someone you know, more neutral? And no, no blood relatives. No blood, no, right? Because because they're not they too can be kind of rough, also yeah. on you. Like you're gonna yeah. say that, right? Exactly. Like, don't say that. Well, what about this? What about this? It is great to talk to your parents and your best friends and find out how do they see you. How do you, you've got to help have other people help you see yourself? We cannot see ourselves by definition. So you really you need that help, and then you've got to practice. It's really performance. It's theater. You have to rehearse. You wouldn't walk on stage without rehearsing, and you can't walk into an interview without a rehearsal. Excellent. Mm -hmm. I like that. Uh, let's get to some questions because we've got some excellent user questions. And and here's one that, uh, oh, oh, we got a, a little interruption here with Mr. Ron. Uh, so I'll just start off here. Roland, come on over here and uh, take a look at a little of this. Um, all right. Ellen, would you advise to have your resume reviewed and revised by an executive recruiting firm? It costs 500 bucks to do this. Oh, it doesn't have to be an executive recruiting firm. It has to be someone you, you can do that. But what you, what you can do is instead, again, is to find someone, use informational interviewing, exploratory interviewing, talk to everyone you know, and try to get, a, try to get someone in a hiring position, although not for that particular job, to review your resume. So you don't have to you don't have to spend a lot of money at first to do this. Hold on, there's so much there's so much excitement going on right here. Hold on, leaning forward. Oh, let's see if that worked. All right, okay. A uh, little technical difficulty. They're here. just testing me. I know. The I love interview. it. Exactly, uh, Eric. What do you think? Pay five hundred bucks to have a review. Ah. What if that review? Wait a second. A lot of times these uh, outplacement, they'll do it for free, right? Uh, yes, outright? right. Yeah, right. But so would you pay for it? 
I wouldn't pay for it. I no, don't think I, so I agree either. With Ellen. I think you can find the a person in a job that's uh, maybe the person who made the introduction for you can review your resume too. They know uh, the kinds of specific things that yep. that hiring manager is looking for. One of the points that Ellen makes in her book is that you need a whole different, you need a whole raft of resumes, different resumes for different jobs, and uh, you want to emphasize different things in different places, and that advisor can help you with that. Yeah. And yeah. don't forget your references. I, I always remind people, you've got this list of references. They're people who are already on your side. Use them to review your resume. And then they, you're engaging them in your job search. The more people who see your resume under the guise of helping you fix it, the more people can lead you to other people. And that's my mantra. Stop looking for a job. Start looking for a person. The right person will lead you to the right job. Excellent. So, Eric, I was going to ask you, when you see resumes, one thing that distinguishes them, in my mind, is if someone said, Eric, will you look at this resume? If you mm. recognize the name, if someone has passed it along, those are the resumes that get the first look, I absolutely, think. Absolutely, absolutely. Not you. you. Everyone's equal. You're like knee-blind admissions. All oh. right, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> no I don't comment. Think, I don't think it's a virtue to be knee-blind in this case. I really don't. I mean, this is, this is value-free. That's not, it's not about nepotism. It's not about anything but reaching out and using your contacts to make sure that you have the advantage to get someone to look at your resume. Because if you ask all these people how they get a job... It'll be through someone they knew. Yeah. And and uh, I just want to point out that Mark in the chat room, and if you would like to join the chat, go to moneywatch.com. He says, talk about uh, uh, what you do now and uh, who you know and what you hope to learn. He thinks aspirational qualities go a long way, where you want to go in your career. What do you think about that, Ron? Do you want to, if you're... Well, I, I think that's, uh, again, becoming a very... Uh, prevalent question where um, you're asked, where do you see yourself going in 10 years? Who do you want to be? Uh, you should have some vision uh, about, you know, where you want to be, what you want to do. Uh, sometimes it's hard, but uh, you should make an attempt to to really scope out how you see your career developing. Uh, that, again, is something that would differentiate you from others who are kind of just uh, wandering in in their job search rather than somebody who really kind of knows what they want. And let me, but, let me, I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to say, can we talk about for one second a bad answer to that question? Yes. The, the sort Give of us the, joke the what answer, not to do. which is where do you see yourself in five years? And the candidate says in your job. Oh, yeah, that's a bad way to, Ooh, that's a yeah. bad Ooh, answer. This is, Now that's aspirational, but then I'm thinking, where do I go? Right. And so I like to ha coach people to say things like, well, what is the path here? What is a typical path here? I'm hoping that this would work out and I would stay here for a long time. That's why I'm here. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that that's something that's important. I remember conducting an interview once where a guy literally started talking to me and said at length about how much, what the things he would change about my company and what I was doing wrong. And I thought, this may be, there may be some kernel of truth to most of this, some of this, part of this. It doesn't even matter. But it was such a turnoff. I was like, really? Well, you're, this is a sales job. You, you don't work here yet. yet. Yes, yeah. Right. You of, don't work here yet. It's a yeah. very, it's a very dangerous situation. I mean, uh, let's go into another question. This is sort of interesting also. I've been with, this is from Deborah. I've been with my company for 11 years. And in that time, I have cross-trained myself to do all the responsibilities of my coworkers in addition to my own job. In my last review, I indicated that I would like to be promoted to a senior specialist since I'm the only one in the department that can do everyone's job. My manager said I needed to show that I was an asset to the company. Besides being insulted by that comment, I wasn't provided specific direction or suggestions on what I was lacking in order to be considered an asset. How do I handle that situation in my next review? Or do I take the hit and look for another job? Ellen, what do you think about that coming, just your gut reaction to that? First of all, she did everything right, and that's fantastic because she did, she did exactly what I recommend people to do to know as much as they can about their company. But um, I would go back. You don't wait for the next review. She needs to go back to that supervisor, go back to other colleagues, and say, what is it specifically that I need to know to move ahead? Because I've been putting in all this time. I've been doing everything right. I care about the company. Why would I learn everybody's job if I didn't care? And so what is it, what, what is the next step that I need to earn this title? Uh, I totally agree with that. I think that uh, you can't assume that your manager is uh, socially skilled or brilliant or a kind person and always says the right thing any more than you can assume the same thing about yourself. And in this instance, I would recommend that she ask the manager specifically what I need to do to be considered an asset and then set up a, a meeting six months and hence to say, all right, let's review 
uh, how I've progressed towards these things, and let's hold you to your word. And, and Ron, I'm sorry. And Ron, what do you think? What if your manager doesn't see in you the things that you believe are in yourself? In other words, how do you? I mean, how do you do that without sort of tooting your own horn? What do you suggest in terms of a way that an employee can talk to uh, the manager or the employer in a way not seeing cocky, but saying, "Here's what I've done for you." Yeah, I, I think that's what I, what I would suggest in this situation <laughs> is that. This uh, person uh, write their own review, lay out the uh, various activities and various mm -hmm. results mm -hmm. they feel they've delivered, uh, and then test that with the manager to see if there's an agreement on whether they have done what was expected and, and delivered the results that were important. And in that discussion, find out what is the nature of being an asset to the company right. and uh, you may be doing a lot of work but the work may not be in the in the asset column of the company it's it's, it's necessary but not considered asset work so in that discussion you can find out whether your work is an asset in that sense I, I was gonna say if you can try to quantify exactly right. what you've done whether is it did you recruit more people have you sold more goods have you raised right. revenue by X percent? These measurable deliverables mm -hmm. are really key to the company, but you're so right, Ron, to try to align them. Make sure that what you're doing is aligned with the company's goals and your manager's goals. What if you um, what if you have a manager who's given you a set of goals in the beginning, but sort of shifted? And now, you know, everyone's business is shifting all the time. And I feel like we get a lot of questions from people who said, I, I did it the way he wanted me to do it, but now he wants it to do it differently. And I'm completely at sea right now. What do you do with that kind of issue, especially obviously in a, in a rough economy, in a rough things economy. are moving all, all the time? I, I think you have to be very proactive about checking in with supervisors more than they will necessarily check in with you. So you can't wait for the next review. And if someone said, this is how we do it a year ago, I, if the supervisor is not taking the initiative to check in, I would really go and check in every month or, or at a, a monthly, a weekly meeting, whatever it is, and say, I just want to make sure that I'm on target. Here's what I think we're doing. And you can also put it in an email. Right. So, you know, you don't have to well, bother them. You don't have to take a lot of face time. You can just say, I just want to make sure. And this is a great way to promote yourself in the workplace, too, right, is to make sure your supervisor does know what you're doing, what you've accomplished, and, uh, and it's a good way to check in. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I, I'm sorry, go on, Ron. No, I would say it goes be beyond also just checking with your supervisor. You should have a good set of tentacles out in the organization so that you know when things are shifting in, around your job. And so, yes, you should be proactive. I agree on uh, your, you know finding out where your supervisor is moving to. But you, it also is important that you have a good antenna about what's shifting, where the priorities are changing, uh, who the players are, new players, you should be very actively involved in that and should not be totally reliant on your supervisor to tell you yeah, when right. these shifts are occurring. Well, and that, that's mm -hmm. why I recommend on the job to be doing a lot of what I call um, internal or inside informational interviewing so that you do have those tentacles out. And uh, I've got a couple of questions about salary negotiations. One from Ty, who says, First, he starts with, how can I ace a phone interview, which I think is very hard, by the way. When is a good time to talk salary? If I'm asked how much I make, do I tell them how much I make or how much I want to make? So what's the answer to that? When you're in, if you're, first of all, let's, let's tackle the salary first. Okay. When do you bring that up and how do you respond? You, should you not just say what you're making? You, you don't bring it up unless they bring it up. Okay. That's the last thing. But you have to have done your homework. So you absolutely, again, through informational interviewing, through using the internet, talking to people, you have to know what the salary ranges are for your skills, for the, ge for the geographical region where you live, for that industry, for that job, for that company, so that this is not a surprise. Now, if they ask, then you have to say, in the range of X, commensurate with experience and commensurate with the details of the job. Because you want to be the last person to put that number on the table. Really? And so you don't just, like, I would just answer the question. I'm such a ding-dong. Like, how much are you making? Well, here's the number. You don't do well, that. Well, you can't lie about it. But don't forget how much you're making is relative in a certain way because you want to talk about benefits. You want to talk about how much you make. Uh, maybe you, you have a certain salary, but you're, you have four weeks vacation at one job, and they're talking about giving you two. 
So you really just, again, want to let them say a number first. And, and because also the lowest number you say may be your salary. You have no idea what they may be thinking. No, that's absolutely true. It's, a, it's an old uh, adage about uh, uh, about negotiating. So the first person who puts a number on the table loses. Right. Well, here's Carol, another right. uh, and here's another question from Caroline. Carolyn, sorry, how would you go about negotiating your base salary, assuming a sales role that's base plus commission, knowing that the future potential employer has pointed out your lack of experience? In other words, you're coming in, maybe you're a job shifter, and you don't have an experience in this field. So now they're talking about what you had made, and then, you know, kind of things are going to shift because they're setting you up. So uh, Carrie says, do you bring up salary in the interview before they send you an offer letter or wait until you see what they're offering? What's appropriate, asks Carrie, the CPA, I might add. Mm. Mm. No way. <laughs> you, you never have more bargaining power than between the time they make you an offer and the time you accept the offer. They want you. So if you, so you have to find out when you, I always tell people, please make a very important distinction between the terms of the offer and the offer of employment. They'll call you up and they'll say, we'd like to offer you the job. And at that point, you just say, thank you so much. I'm so excited. And then I tell people to say, so, you know, I'm, I'm so thrilled. What was it that distinguished me from other candidates, which is what uh, Ron was talking about before? And then they will tell you why they're hiring you as opposed to someone else. And those are your well, weapons in the negotiation because you're going to find out exactly from them why you are valuable to them. Right. And and also, you know, I think that when you start in, down this road and you're actually are talking about money, uh, and as I've learned from you, Ellen, and lots of different experts, that, you know, it doesn't all have to be rolled cash. into your salary and cash, that there are other things to certainly negotiate for in the long run. And also, you know, it is a tight job market. market so right. if it's thawing, it's it's Great, but it's not like, woo, everyone's running after you. But people have different things they care about. So you find out what you really care about, what's important to you, what's important to the company. So you may care more about vacation or a later start time than actual cash, although technically you want the highest base salary that you can get. But I always recommend to people that they have a few fake negotiation things, Ooh. things that they don't really want. <laughs> Ron likes agree. that one. All right? or I care, agree with that. Or care that much that. about. So you say, you know, I right. really want the title of X. And then they say, you know, we really can't bend on that. We're just going to have to keep you as being an associate editor. And then you say, well, okay, uh, you know, let me think about that if there's no flexibility there. And then when they come back with another item on the list, you say, well, you know, I compromised on that title. Oh, I and love so, that. So you're mm -hmm. just, I mean, these are just negotiation tactics. And you really have to have an arsenal of, of, of well thought out and well researched and rehearsed tactics. Now, Ron, yeah, I, he, I'm sorry, go on. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, I think these skills are very important, especially right now, because many people are just so happy to maybe get a job now, they'll just essentially accept. But there is a process of negotiating and coming up with the right salary figure for you. And there's nothing wrong, by the way, of including some uh, of some valuable personal data. If you're, your life is changing, you're getting married, you're going to move to a new city, you need to incorporate all of that in your bargaining chips as you start talking about your willingness to work with this organization. Uh, here's an interesting question uh, from Anonymous. Don't worry, you're safe with us, Anonymous. I started a new job, and the old manager is transitioning out of the position. Now, Ron, Anonymous found out the old manager made more money than he or she is making. So here it is. I'm taking this new job, and I'm making 105000 I find out the manager whose job I'm taking is making one twenty. Whatever. Let's say, say through the grapevine. I don't even know how. What do you do with that information? Should you go and ask for more money? Well, I, again, you, you're the, the person who left may have had a different arrangement at a different time. I, I think you, you have accepted a certain amount. Uh, you can probably come in and say, I want to come in right away and, and get some results and then uh, you know, come back and have salary review in about six months. Right. Uh, I think you look at ways in which you could lay out a path to having your salary reviewed based on your starting six months. And and uh, what if you, I mean, I, I don't want to be 
litigious yeah. or anything. I just, but I mean, like, what if there's no budging on that? I mean, that seems sort of unfair. The, the, the person who was in the job that you're taking makes more than you. Ellen is rolling her eyes at me right now, No, Ron. no, only because the person who's there, I agree, and that's, a, I'm also rolling my eyes because that's happened to me. When I found out what the salary was, of, when I left a company and I found out what they paid the next person, and it, I mean, that was, well, anyway, that was the opposite, but it, it just was, it, you know, the, the reality is that the, the manager who's leaving, what the manager has is knowledge of the company and the employees. Right. So there right. is a value to that, and I, right. but I think, as, as Ron said, I would try to negotiate an er, uh, earlier review and to peg it to something measurable so that it's not soft. It's saying, you know what, I think I can do exactly what this previous person did and I can do it better. And if I've done that in X amount of time, I would like to, to have my base change to what his was. And let me let let's just go um, into sort of a more general stuff. I, I just got an email from I'm sorry in the chat room we we have somebody who's asking negotiating salary phone or email. Now let's assume you can't do face to face because I mean I think it's kind of wimpy not to do it face to face. Mm. But let's just assume that it's not. So uh, I would always do the phone. I'm a confrontational person, though. I would always want that, like, as close to the human being as possible. I think that's right. But then you actually want to get these things in writing. Right. So that, well, I think it's true. Both. I think right. you want to follow. I, I would always prefer to have a phone conversation because you can hear in a voice when someone's hesitating or whether they say no right away or yes right away. I think that's really, really important. However, I would immediately, I would be taking notes the whole time, and I would be following up with an email <coughs> that says, as we discussed, Thank you so much for checking back with your supervisor about whether there's flexibility in this benefit. Well, and write everything down. I think you have more power in a, in a phone call, too. Uh, while you can hear what the other side is thinking you know, in their yeah. voice, you also can be more persuasive. Uh, and the other side doesn't have a chance to think about it and walk away and come back and be uh, harder-nosed about things. Right. And um, do you find, Eric, negotiating in person like a face-to-face, -face, is that harder or easier, or do you care? Um, well, I think it's more effective. I think you've, you probably get to a better result that pleases both sides that way. It's just, you, can, you can figure out the, um, the, the unspoken body language. And what's important, right? Right, mm -hmm. right. But, but right. just remember, they will offer you, that it's, their, it's the employer's job to offer you the lowest number that he can right. to save money for his company, and it's your job to advocate for why you deserve the higher range of scale. Not based on your needs, but based on your talents and skills and what you can bring to the company. I would argue, too, that you can't argue very persuasively based on what a previous person made in the job. Mm. You don't want right. to be in a position of treating the company like a kind of civil service setup where you you should be a grade A employee. I think it's much better to, you, you have the moral uh, power of knowing that you were, that someone who preceded you was paid more, but you then have to fill that space with your own accomplishments. Right. And what you can well, do for them. Mm -hmm, right. Yeah, and I, I would add that uh, yeah, there's the, the, the hard uh, negotiation skills, but there's kind of the soft approach of really your, your intent is to find a meeting of the minds. You're really, mm -hmm. when you're yeah. talking face to face or by phone, you're trying to bring in enough uh, emotion, enough personability to get a meeting of the minds of what's there. And I agree with Ellen, they're going to offer you the lowest thing, and your job is to kind of get a meeting of the minds that what's what's right, what's more appropriate, what's, you know, more uh, rewarding for you. And right. so you, you're working on that. You know, that it's fu and it's place. funny, you also have to remember you, you, I mean, sometimes you're negotiating with somebody you're really working for directly. And if you have yes. a contentious negotiation, right. it can really affect your workplace. Mm. And it can, you know, I remember that my boss said to me, he's like, why don't you have an agent? I don't want to have to negotiate with you and then work with you. I'm like, yeah, you don't work with me that closely. Don't worry about it. But it's yeah. true. And there is some something to be said, like you negotiate into submission and then actually can change your the relationship. relationship. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and you really do want to remember that you're you're wanting to get to win-win on both sides. You, They want you, and you want to work there. Yes. And so we tell people to keep saying over and over, I'm sure that we can that we can get to agreement here. We, I want this exactly. to work. I know we can make this work out. Never with a stance of aggression or hostility, because it's right. not the point. Right. right. All right, I'll have to Very remember good. that going into my next contract negotiation. Okay, <laughs> Mike, Mike is in Toronto, and Mike says, I am 51 years old with a significant depth of verifiable sales and business development experience. That's the one great thing about being in sales. You can quantify it. It's yes. so easy, mm -hmm. right? I suspect, however, that I'm being discriminated against because of my age. Is this a reality in the current economic climate? 
Ellen Gordon Reeves. Is there ageism? Who's close, <gasps> to, who's close to his age, but I won't uh, say <laughs> the big the big birthday is coming up. Uh, there is ageism in the in the workplace. There is, but the thing that he has to remember is, he, I, first of all, I wouldn't get paranoid. It will affect his performance and his mm. stance towards his employers and the and the clients. And I think what's important to say is what you have is experience, and they can't take that away from you, and that's worth money. So, uh, whereas the young people, and I, I absolutely talk out of both sides of my mouth when I'm talking to both at, at, uh, ends of the age spectrum, because I have to tell the young people, here's what you have as an advantage. You're younger, you're cheaper, you're, you may be more flexible. On the other right. hand, you're not socialized into the workplace yet. We have to train you to do that. We have to teach you to take direction as well as initiative. What an older person has is the experience, the people skills, the life skills, all of that. So there, you really want to think more about that than about what might not be happening. And uh, Ron, let me ask you a question because you you do a lot of consulting with the big mama and papa companies out there. <laughs> and I'm just wondering, you know, that we've seen so much information about women who still earn less than men. Um, in fact, Victoria, our producer, and I were just talking before we came on the air about how, you know, it's just so hard to recruit, say, African-Americans into certain industries and how they don't feel welcome. And what's happening out there in terms of like at, now that the recession is over, is there a renewed push to? To bring more women and people of color and more diversity into the workplace? Well, I'm not sure there is. I, I think uh, right now it's just very competitive. And uh, I, I think that push is not there yet. As there's more growth in the uh, in the industries and, and in the economy, there probably will be a, a greater push because there'll be a greater need. But right now, as things are tight, it's very competitive. So uh, I agree with Ellen. This is not a time to get paranoid that you know there, there, there's going to be less of uh, uh, opportunity. But it is a time to really apply and be competitive right now. Um, mm -hmm. uh, other, everybody's trying to get in as the doors are opening. Okay, here's another question: Is applying to a blind job posting a waste of time? Aren't job postings just a way to satisfy HR? Are most jobs really hired from within? or by someone known to the hiring party. Ellen, should you post? Should you send it in blind? Will you ever get through? So 20% of the time, approximately, you'll get through. So I think this is not the best use of your time. I mm -hmm. say please do not spend your time sending your resume hurtling into the black void of cyberspace. <laughs> However, if you right. see a posting, it's not going to hurt you to send, to send it in. That's how you're, if you're, that's how you find out about it, great. But what you need to do is follow up. Use all your networks. Use Facebook. Use your social network. Use any kind of community network to find someone who works at that company, in that industry, so that you can get your resume looked at instead of this uh, blind morass of, of thousands of resumes coming in that may be being checked first only by a computer. Mm. Because it really is the case that over 80% of jobs are filled by personal referral. And 80%, although I understand it's not the same, 80%, I'm not a statistician, but I like to conflate these two, 80% of jobs are never advertised. They exist in what we call the hidden job market. So you've got to be out there interviewing, exploratory, uh, informational, talking to everyone you know, and not just uh, blindly looking and spending your days behind a computer screen. You've got to get out there and talk to people, at least three people a day. Three people a day. Wow. That's a lot. At minimum. At minimum. At minimum. What do you want? You want wow. us to do more three than that? Three people a day. Three. All right. We can well, do three. It's Bref a said, really, uh, right? Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah, it's really a job. Uh, three people a day at a minimum. And uh, it has to be uh, right now. You want somebody to introduce you in. Oh, Ooh. oh, we lost it. So you do want someone to introduce you into, get, to, to be able to bring you into the organization, right, Eric? No, so you do. No, in I... place, and, and now they're trying to uh, move into jobs. Oh, all right, we're going to have to come back to Ron. Uh Eric, if you come into a company as an intern or let's just say a low level, like we, you know, we know plenty of young producers who get into TV and radio and they mm -hmm. come in very, and you know, sort of this young, you know, eager person. The question here is, uh, should you leave the company in order to really see advancement? In other words, are you going to get pigeonholed as the young one, the intern, or she was the this or he was the that? Are you going to get pigeonholed? Should you try to leave and then maybe hopscotch back in at a higher level? I would say that being an intern at a company is the best way to get hired there. So it's a great way to get in uh, as on the cheap um, and with low expectations that you can easily exceed if you're energetic and you try really hard. 
Then when you get hired, that's when that problem you described, Jill, might come up. Then you're thought of as being kind of an entry-level employee and uh, uh, you know, the junior assistant uh, associate editor, and that may be a hard one to break. Uh, then you may need to move laterally. But the internship is a great way to get hired. And once you're hired, once you have some actual payroll job experience, then you're a lot more valuable commodity on the market right. as, as a whole. Uh, I totally agree. And then I think at that point, if once you've made it into the company, then you have to do what the uh, what Carrie, the questioner, I think, asked. She was learning everybody else's job. She was mm -hmm. talking to mm -hmm. other people in the company. Right. You volunteer. And I tell particularly young people, don't be so fast, particularly in this economy, to leave a job until you know what your next step is, where you want to go, and then try at your current company to earn that title, to earn the skills, to have them pay for professional development in terms of maybe computer training, another language training, things that you can use on at that job, but that you know will be valuable. But a lot of people don't take the time to figure out where they want to go next. Right. And it's, it's just don't jump ship before you have made the most of your current workplace because they know you. And uh, yeah. let, before, let's talk about jumping ship for a second, because Ron, you um, have a great blog post up about how to deal with extremely difficult colleagues. And, uh, you know, there are people who would, uh, I'm sure, look and say, oh, it's like it, it, it pains me to wake up every morning. I have to work with this horrible shrew. I have to work with this nasty guy. And what is the way around this? Give, give us some real useful tips, because Eric is leaning in because he can't stand working with me so much <laughs> that he's wondering what he can do to get through the day. Well, as I was saying in my blog, that there's a lot of, effort to really de determine first whether it's just your personal annoyance or this person has some characteristics that essentially offend the rest of the team or people around them. And you're trying to distinguish whether it's in a personal annoyance that you have with this person or is it a performance problem in which the person is creating mm. uh, issues with other people like yourself. And so as you define that it's not you uh, and it's really something other person, then I think you want to move to try to get your manager and other people to manage this particular situation. But, um, you, you know, you will find that you'll be annoyed at different people's habits. Uh, you will have to develop some uh, hard, thick skin to be able to deal with some of them. But it, be, it changes when it becomes a performance issue. Mm, right. And then and then you really do have to make something official happen, right? Well, right. I, I think, right. but, and, and one thing I, I have to say I learned from teaching uh, was I would always want to go call the parents right away when I was a young teacher. And my master teachers would say, did you talk to the child first? Oh, uh, that's what interesting. What a concept. And I would say, no, 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 I was going to call the parents right away. No. And then I would take Tommy aside and say, Tommy, you haven't done your math homework for five days. What's going on? And then he'd say, my dog died. Oh. And then I would realize, well, you know, he's not unmotivated. He's unhappy and he needs a new puppy. So it really was a good lesson for me. It's very hard to do this as an adult when someone's performance or behavior is not is not pleasing to you. But I really learned from teaching to say to people, also, your behavior isn't working for you. And to go to people and say, I, you know, I, I'm puzzled by what's going on. What's your goal here? How can we work better together? What's really going on? And I found, even though it wasn't always my instinct to go towards people who, with whom I had difficulty, well, maybe it is my instinct because I'm not really conflict averse. Okay, but it was, um, I really have learned so much by taking the higher road and really turning the other cheek and going towards them and saying, we both work here. We have the same, we should have the same goals. What's really going on? Can we talk it out? and find out if there's something that you, you'd be surprised what you'll find out about what's going on in people's lives. Mm. But if that doesn't work, then you need, and you should always alert though, a supervisor or somebody or HR so that there's a record. You don't want to get into a tussle with somebody and have no record of it or have it be my word against your word. But try, I would try a personal approach offsite. Can I take you to coffee? Can we have lunch? Can we figure it out? And then if we really can't, then we take it to the next level. Mm. In the interest of the company, what you said, Ron, about it's about then it becomes about performance and about working, doing the best job for the company and meeting people's expectations. Ellen, before that uh, coffee date with your uh, with your opponent, do you alert supervisor then or only afterwards? Or do you wait until you see whether that coffee date works? That, that's a good question. You might say you might want to go on record as saying we, there's been a conflict and, and maybe go to HR or to a supervisor and say, this is the going on. I, is it okay with you if I try to resolve this personally and get it on the record, get things down? And, then, and if, the, if the supervisor says, no, I want to intervene, 
then let him or her handle it. If not, I would say, this is what I'm planning to try. Is that okay? Let me go to the person. I'll report back on the conversation, and then maybe we'll all need to meet together. Uh, I would say by the time you've done that, you've pretty much determined it's a greater performance issue. Um, by the time you alert HR or your supervisor, you know, by that time, there's, there's an issue there, and you are, are looking for a wider set of resources to confirm or to support or to work it out with you. So uh, you pretty much determine where what, what it is. It, it's it's what serious. Happen, well, let me ask you, what happens if something is brought up in a performance review and you just think it's malicious? In other words, uh, you know, something gets, po- gets into your review and your coworker has said something not great about you and who may or may not like you, dislike you, whatever, but you really disagree. Ellen, if you dispute that in the meeting and say, look, this is not, has nothing to do with my job performance, what, do you, what is the best way to do it? Because that's in a written record. It, this is so important. The first mm-hmm. thing is how you react to the allegation in the meeting is extremely important. So you have to train yourself even before you walk into a review to hear something, to prepare to hear something that may not be true or may be incendiary. And you have to not react with anger or alarm. And right. you have to say, you know, and this, you can train this. This is rehearsal. You train yourself to listen and to say, I'm really surprised to hear that. I'm not sure what the basis for that is. I want to talk to so-and-so. This is not my understanding of the situation. And don't make an accusation. Don't say, I know this must be personal. It's because I did this or she did that. Be very neutral. Investigate and do not sign the review you mm. must not let this become a part of your permanent record. Interesting. So if you don't you've sign investigated, it, but if, if you don't they make sign you it, sign it, you, or you have to say, you know, this is I. This is something that is a surprise to me. It is not. It does not reflect my understanding of what happened, or what I've done, or what he said, or what she said. I think we're going to need to pursue this further with the other person or with uh, another supervisor. And I would. Um, so. If I need to sign this, I'm, I'm not prepared to sign it yet until we've all investigated this further and until I have a note in the file where I and Get my other d- colleagues have responded. Right. But try yeah. not to blow up in the, in the review because it will only reflect poorly on you. Mm. Ron, yeah, what do you think? I, I think generally if you have, uh, and if anything ever comes up negative in a, in a situation like that, you want to have kind of a process that you will put in place to confirm or build a factual base for. So if anything comes up, like you know, a, 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 a colleague who has an issue with you or something that didn't come off the way you thought it came off, then you want to have kind of a, well, here's the process that I'm going to use to go and confirm this or figure this out or engage this person. So uh, Ellen, as, as you talk about practice, I. That's something I talk about all the time is you really have to practice, practice your responses to a lot of difficult situations. And and Mm -hmm. I think also Mm -hmm. we have to back up a little bit. If you've been doing, if you've been really managing your own career at a place the right way, you've been documenting your successes. Right. You've been even documenting your failures, where you came up short. You've been sending, uh, I would never say to take proprietary information. This is not what I'm saying. But you need records of what you've done. You need templates of things that you've done. You need records of emails. Whenever I have a conversation with someone, I I put it in writing and and add bullet points, and they can confirm or deny. They can answer the email, not answer the email, but then at least I have a paper trail of what I say happened. And I think it's important to be doing this all along the way so that there aren't surprises. In in a well-managed situation, there will be fewer surprises because both parties are in touch with each other. But poor communication is often a a problem. And if somebody decides near the end of a review they want to get rid of you, you will suddenly see a heating up of a paper trail. Uh, Do do you think that, Ron, where they're going to start documenting things and saying, oh, you haven't done this, and what about this, and what about this? You have to be really careful. And and yeah. you know, and and listen, you know, you want to be. I think that most people who are working in an organization, they're working together. They want to, they want to be working together. So there may be something in that's going on that actually can bring you closer. It certainly has happened when I was the boss, and people would come to me with their problems, and we kind of get in the room and hash it out. What we often found was afterwards, man, we've got something really good going here. We got we cleared the air, cleared the air and right. everybody feels better. And there's not this weird cloud, especially this in the tension. T- yeah, tension. exactly. So I think that that's something that's uh, really, I think, a very, a really important thing is to communicate and to all basically say, hey, look, we all want the same thing. 
What's the difference here? Now I'm going to have to wrap it up because Victoria is getting very controlling. Even though she said she loves you, Ron, and she definitely <laughs> loves Ellen, she's like, wrap it up. We're done. So I want to thank everybody for participating. Ellen Gordon Reeves, who is the uh, best selling author of Can I Wear My Nose Ring to the Interview? And Ron Brown, go check out his blog. It's fabulous. It's called Power Plays on MoneyWatch.com. And uh, thank you both for participating. I think this is really kind of like robust stuff when people have jobs and are worried about jobs and we're coming out of this employment situation. So let's all like together a little collective moment of silence and prayer that we have a good employment report on Friday. Okay, guys? Yeah, all right. Right. That, that, right. Thank you. right. Thank you so much for participating and thank you all for watching. We'll see you next week on Ask the Experts. Great. Thank you, Joe.